<laughs> now we're really getting going. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and wish you a very happy Energy Awareness uh, Month and Weatherization Day, which is also now Weatherization Month. Uh, technically, uh, Weatherization Day is on October 30th, but we're celebrating a little early and uh, it's always an important issue that we want to raise awareness about. Uh, weatherization plays such a critical role in our efforts to decarbonize our economy. And so we wanted to spend today with some experts who are working in this field, creating green jobs, working in weatherization, and really helping to lead the shift to a clean energy economy in New York. Uh, we know it's going to take all of us to play a role in this incredible transformation. And so we're excited to, to hear from the folks today and hear from all of you uh, on your thoughts and questions. So if you could please uh, put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom and, uh, and we'll get going. Um, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague and friend, Ibrahim Abdul-Mateen, uh, who uh, is joining us today from the West Coast, although a New Yorker. Uh, we're so happy to have you here and, and help to, to moderate this session, Ibrahim. And I know you wear many hats. Um, and today you will be repping uh, the Living Future Institute, I believe, uh, <laughs> and probably others as well. But, you know, as always, so happy to have you uh, be here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beta. Thank you to everyone who are, who are on. Thank you to folks who have logged in for our panelists. Um, this is an exciting conversation because it represents the evolution of this industry and of these conversations. I would say some of you remember the whole green jobs sort of call that was in the early of the Obama administration. We've come a long way from those days. Um, we were making the case back then. Now it's much more of a tactical conversation. Now we're shifting into a conversation around decarbonization, which we could not even, well, we did imagine it that back then, but I think we didn't really realize how it was gonna happen. So now, we're, and now we have to push even more. So these conversations where we bring together people from all different aspects of the industry will really move the conversation forward and push the policymakers and the, and the um, producers and all the builders to make better decisions. Um, the folks that I do represent, I do represent the Living Future Institute, which we have the green building, uh, the most stringent green building standards to live in building um, challenge, um, as well as I'm, I've been working on a project with NYU, um, looking at how you can implement the UN S, um, sustainable development goals throughout New York City to make New York City a, a cleaner and healthier place to live. And I'm always, always representing as Beta's friend because she's a force of energy in this work and um, a, a light throughout New York State trying to push these things forward. So without further ado, I'm gonna push it back to you, Betta, to get this thing started. You're so sweet, Ibrahim, and thank you. And, and I appreciate the you bringing it back to, to Obama and that era with green jobs, just kind of getting into the consciousness. And I remember hearing, you know, Van Jones and being right. like, wow, that sounds amazing. Like, yeah. we need to do that. <laughs> and now we're doing it. And New York is leading the way. Uh, so I will introduce uh, Samantha Pierce, the Vice President of Sustainability for Homes and Community Renewal. We are so delighted to have you, Samantha. And uh, yeah, please share your screen and take it away. Great, thank you, Betta. And everyone can hear me okay. And hopefully in just one second, you'll be able to see the full screen there. Um, so just I think I get a heads up or okay from Betta or Michaela or someone, that'd be great. That were great, thanks everyone. Okay. Um, so thank you, um, Beta, and, and to all the New Yorkers for clean, uh, for clean Energy for your collaboration with HCR and AEA on planning this very timely uh, teach-in and hosting this event, and also Happy Weatherization Month to everyone on the phone. Um, today, I was really tasked with giving an overview for the state's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and how that relates to how that will hopefully be transforming the work we do in sustainability creating jobs for New York State, um, increasing our work with weatherization, and how HCR plays a role um, in all of that great work that we have planned. Um, 
So New York State, as many of you may have heard, um, has been really focused on carbon reductions um, for, for more than a decade now. And there's been several programs that have been out before this, but really excitingly, um, in 2019, the state passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, um, known for short as CLCPA, and sometimes referred to as short as Climate Act. Um, and the act was introduced um, uh, introduced uh, the formation of a Climate Action Council, which was a 22-member committee that included seven advisory panels filled with industry professionals, as well as a just transition working group. So this whole conglomeration made up a comprehensive multi-sector approach um, to look at how the Climate Action Council could assess and come up with a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 and at least 85% by 2050. You can see on the screen here, there's some other targets that the CLCPA set out, and I'm, I'm highlighting the ones that we'll be speaking about today. Um, another important one of note was to really focus on the power generation side of things and work towards 100% zero emissions electricity generation by 2040. That'll be important in just a second. Um, so wanted to call that to, a, to everyone's attention. Um, so a, a new report um, by Demos shows that transitioning to 100% renewable economy would add around 150,000 jobs to the New York economy over the next decade through this work. Um, and so it seemed fitting that I would take this opportunity to go over how these opportunities and what the recommendations of the panel were that would impact this area of work for everyone on the call today. Um, so to put this at scale and to give some shape to it um, around the building sector and what the work scope would then potentially be as a frame, um, I'll go over some sort of data and statistics. Uh, the building sector represents about 30% of the state's overall greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is now the largest sector in the state, beating out transportation as of recent calculations. I don't know if that's good or bad for us. Um, and of that 30% share of greenhouse gas emissions in the state, home heating contributes around 60% of those emissions, as you can see in this little circle chart here. Um, and so what does that all represent and like what is New York State by the numbers? Um, there's about 6 million home, um, 6 million buildings in New York State, of which 70% of those were constructed before there was an energy code in place. There's about 8 million residential units, and if you break that down, that's 5.5 million single family or one to four unit buildings, and about 3 million units of multifamily buildings in that pie. Um, and of that, approximately one and a half million of those buildings are located in disadvantaged communities, um, which is a term that while it doesn't indicate low income housing, is usually a good proximity locator for. Um, the weatherization program in New York State currently supports around eight to 10,000 units a year on average that we're touching. Um, and our counterparts over on the Empower program usually touch around 14,000 units. So all in, that's about 23 young units 23,000 units a year the state is providing support for. So if you did the math really quick in your head, that's less than 1% of the homes we're currently touching with current funding. Um, and I'll just point out that during ERA funding, we did touch just over 100,000 homes. So there is a potential for the network um, to scale to that, to, to, to you know, more than twice its, its uh, sorry, four times its um, current capacity. Um, Okay, so the Energy and Efficiency Housing Panel was one of those seven panels that made up the um, advisor, uh, made up the Climate Action Council's advisory panel. Um, and so on the slide here, you'll see lots of words. I'm going to go over this really quickly for time's sake, um, but this represents the recommendations of the panel to the Climate Action Council. And I'll highlight today just a few of the key elements that I think will really help drive job creation um, and, and start bolstering some of the work we're currently doing. So you'll see on the first, um, one of the first recommendations is to enact high efficiency building code standards that require fossil fuel phase out over time. And this had a multi you know, page recommendation that went along with it. Um, I will note that the full list of recommendations can be found on climate.ny.gov website. So this is public information you can review. 
Um, but to dive into what, what's really important for us today to think about is that um, this means that by 2025 for single family and 2030, the panel was recommending to adopt an electric state code for new construction. Um, so that would really change how we're building things. And importantly for our network of um, you know, weatherization, that we would adopt a zero emission standards for the retirement of space heating and domestic hot water equipment by 2030 in single family and 2035 in multifamily and commercial buildings. So this means that with these clean energy targets, there's a clear course of action for decarbonizing our building stock through utilizing high efficiency all electric heating um, to drastically reduce our carbon um, and our site carbon emissions from our buildings, touching on that 60% piece of our, our building's carbon emissions. Um, another recommendation from the panel was to really benchmark all of our buildings that are over 10,000 square feet. And as those of you from the city might know, this is already a requirement through Local Law 84 and really helps us identify our high performers, both for the industry to understand which buildings we should be weatherizing and investing our money in. Um, and also lets us see how we've been doing. Um, one of the other recommendations was to create an equitable gas transition, a process for gas industry workers, including job transition and training. This is a key element to the panel's recommendations to ensure they're an equitable transition from fossil fuel for not only buildings to ensure we're not leaving behind buildings in low um, income areas and disadvantaged communities, but also to ensure that we're transitioning and training fossil fuel um, staff to uh, adapt their knowledge into other areas in clean energy sector. Um, and then, of course, we had a recommendation from the panel to support workforce education, training, and job placement. And there's many components to this recommendation by the advisory panel. Um, and I'm sure Samir, uh, my co-presenter, will get into a lot of these as part of his um, review today as part of the Just Transition Working Group. Um, so as we celebrate Weatherization Month, um, this work scope that the panel recommended, um, if it's not clear, is really a clear illustration of the importance of weatherization and the network's ability to deliver these services to our low and moderate income and disadvantaged communities. Um, and the work will require support and training for these new measures that we introduce to the workforce. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll also include and need and demand support for identifying um, how the network identifies uh, opportunities for heat pump, as well as training for the staff to understand how to do that work. Um, so the new scope might include things like replacing ventilation, air sealing direct vent shafts, and replacing 20-year-old oil burners. Some of this is typical weatherization work, but in this replacement, we might also install an air source heat pump or a multi-zone mini split in place of a fossil fuel burning equipment in the coming years. We might also want to put in enhanced or virtual thermostats that provide programmable comfort settings and nighttime setbacks. And in some cases, we might look to ground source heat pumps where feasible. Um, so all of this are new measures that we would be needing to train and support our network in how to install. And if we pair this scope with programs like NYSERDA's solar program or other solar programs, um, we can really start to provide on-site energy and battery storage to help further the savings for our buildings. And the potential of buildings on what weatherization providers do well, retaining the roots of the program and the mission to help our most vulnerable and low income residents must be our focus. I think I did something wrong here. Oops, skipped one, sorry. Um, the work ahead of our weatherization network really needs to look at assessing current support and training for advanced performance building envelopes, expanding technical path capacity for the network to gain familiarity with air source heat pumps, water source heat pumps, and even ground source heat pumps, really understand the needs for our communities, both in consumer education and ongoing support, and really advocate for necessary program structure structures to align the state's goals with the resources that are available or that we need to request. And we really need to consider tracking carbon emissions as part of our work in weatherization, which we currently don't do. The state is actively working to help create and structure programs um, like enhancing weatherization. And we're really working to help provide that support to the network and others as we ramp up. 
One example of this from NYSERDA is the Clean Energy Hub RFP that was recently released during Climate Week just about a month ago at this point now. Um, and HCR is really committed to looking at all of our programs and how we're um, engaging and working with the recommendations of the Climate Action Council. And so one example of this is um, we recently released a joint effort with NYSERDA where for new construction tax credit applicants were actually able to provide additional gap funding or subsidy to allow those new construction projects to look at electrification and high performance buildings. Um, so there's a lot of work going on within our agency to focus um, and to really look at how we can offer these services and support to our network. Um, and our agencies see the potential not only to align funding sources, but to really deepen our collaboration between programs like weatherization and even empower um, to help broaden our reach and industry training potential in the network. Um, so thank you so much um, for the opportunity to speak. I think I'll pass it back to, to Beta now. Beta, sorry. Thanks so much, Samantha. Um, it's Beta, uh, but everybody mixes that up. So I answered it pretty much anything. Um, that was fantastic. It is really exciting to hear all of the innovative work uh, that you all are doing and starting to do on the electrification front. And yeah, I can't wait to, to learn more, but thank you for giving and that I, quick overview. And I think that that also reinforces Beta, this uh, sort of we're moving away from a lot of what you just shared was very like, specific next steps, to-do list items, tactical things that people can do as opposed to making the case. We've already made the case that we need to make these changes. So I'm super excited about that. Um, next, we wanna have your colleague and your partner in crime, um, most likely, um, and also one of my colleagues and partner in crime, um, and also one of the most creative people in this entire state just, just arrived, but now, and when you couple creativity and energy efficiency, you get um, Samir Hanade of, of NYSERDA. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Samir. Uh, great, is this a good distance? Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I, thought you were, I thought you were being socially distant on, oh, online. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Betta. And Samantha, I really look forward to working with you. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited to be at this event and especially with Ibrahim because you were like the first person I met in New York State, and you really helped me build instrumental community connections. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's passion and leadership in this. And I think that all of us in the different roles that we have, we can strengthen and expand weatherization to protect and improve the lives of all New Yorkers. And as we talked about at the beginning, you know, this topic is really near and dear to my heart because. Back in 2009, when I chose to focus my career on climate change, I remember learning about Van Jones. Um, and that was like, you know, right around the time of Aura and stuff. And I heard him describe how weatherization can tackle both pollution and poverty and achieve racial, economic, and environmental justice. And I'm really thrilled to say that we are going to be taking this holistic approach in our state to weatherize homes and we're going to prioritize the work where it's most needed to protect and improve human health and well being and employ um, a more diverse and skilled workforce. So I'll share, um, go a little bit, um, describe a little bit about what NYSERDA's programs are, um, talk about the climate change law um, uh, with regards to the environmental justice uh, aspects of it. Um, and then I'll identify a couple of things that we could potentially address to scale up and provide pathways for you to engage in state policy and program development. Um, and I, th I think you know, everybody understands this, but you know, as, as the impacts of climate change get worse with heat waves, hurricanes, and brutally cold winters driven by the polar vortex, it really becomes clear that every person deserves a home that is sealed, energy efficient, resilient, and powered by renewable energy instead of fossil fuels. And you know, with the Climate Act, there's a huge opportunity to focus on this. Um, and Samantha described the, uh, the residential sector uh, uh, contribution or the building sector contribution. I ran some um, specific numbers. And um, when you account for the electricity consumed by residential buildings and um, the on-site fossil uh, combustion for cooking space and water heating, the residential building sector is about 23% 
of New York statewide greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a huge opportunity, nearly a quarter, we can bring it down to zero. And um, you know, there's nearly 50% of our state's um, households are low uh, to moderate income, and we can you know, achieve the greatest social benefit by prioritizing with them. Um, along with HCR, we administer weatherization and energy efficiency initiatives for low to moderate income households called LMI. Uh, we have the Empower program funded at about 50 million. We have assisted home performance with Energy Star. It's the same type of program, but uh, for moderate income. And we've developed a statewide LMI portfolio with a budget of 880 million through 2025 to fund energy efficiency work in small homes, apartments, affordable housing, and support high performance, affordable new construction. But obviously we have a huge amount of work to do to scale these efforts. And our Climate Act provides that pathway. You know, it has the ambitious target to lower emissions uh, by 85% below 1990 levels by 2050. And we can make some really transformative changes um, in, in implementing this law. Uh, the Climate Action Council, as Samantha described, they're doing their work um, and they're developing a draft scoping plan on you know, the policies and programs that will achieve those targets. And you can, um, we'll have the opportunity to offer feedback on that. I'll share more on that in a moment. But I mean, obviously we know that achieving our greenhouse gas targets are going to require significant amounts of new investment. And to ensure these investments are made in a just manner, the Climate Act requires the state to aim for realizing at least 40% of the benefits of all spending on clean energy and energy efficiency be in communities that are you know, under-resourced and overburdened by pollution, which uh, the act calls disadvantaged communities. And we are currently defining what constitutes a disadvantaged community. The Climate Act established the Climate Justice Working Group to develop the criteria for that. Uh, I expect uh, a draft to come out in um, December, no later than December. And as, as soon as the draft is released, you'll have the opportunity to comment on it for 120 days. And the state also needs to define what the benefits of clean energy and energy efficiency investments are. We're currently working on that in consultation with the working group. And while this is still under development, I can say the benefit definition will be holistic. It will include the amount of actual dollars invested as a key metric, as well as things like direct and indirect job creation, energy bill savings, clean air and improved health. And as everyone knows, weatherization can deliver on all of these benefits. Um, according to the latest report that I saw, a dollar invested in weatherization yields at least $3 in benefits, but it's probably more than that. So there's a whole lot of good, of social good that we can accomplish by this. And now we have a state law that compels us to lower emissions and grow a clean economy in a just manner. But we definitely have our work cut out for us to implement the objectives of that law well. A couple things that we clearly need, we need, a, a have, we need to have a bigger pot of money. Um, we must increase awareness in frontline and under-resourced communities of the available programs and resources and um, that's where the clean energy hubs, you know, they can help accomplish that. We have to streamline how different weatherization programs are administered to make them more efficient. And, you know, as I'm sure everyone knows, there's lots of homes with health and safety issues like leaky roofs, mold and asbestos that have to be addressed before they can be weatherized. But, you know, people who live in those homes can't afford those fixes. Fortunately, NYSERDA is partnering with the Department of Health going, and we're going to launch a pilot program to fund whole scale fixes to these homes with Medicaid recipients that suffer from asthma. And you know, we need to significantly broaden and diversify the workforce that does weatherization um, so that we can build an inclusive clean economy. I'm really delighted to say that this is a strategic priority of NYSERDA and we're assessing how we can increase the diversity of the installer and contractor industry. The climate law requires us to identify barriers to progress, like I mentioned, and develop opportunities to solve them. At this moment, we're actually seeking public input on these barriers and opportunities as it relates to climate resilience, 
clean energy efficient buildings and protection from air pollution. We want to make these universally accessible to every community in New York. So if you have ideas on how programs could be designed and administered to be more effective in reaching disadvantaged communities, please give your input. We're accepting comments online and holding two virtual public hearings, November three and four. Um, I dropped it in the chat, so check out uh, the, the link. And um, if you have thoughts on policies and ways to fund weatherization, there'll be ample opportunities for you to do that uh, when the draft scoping plan is released uh, by the Climate Action Council in 2022. And I just want to end by um, thanking all of you again. Really appreciate your leadership and your involvement and being a part of this community. Wow, oh, Samira didn't give a poem. I'm, I'm not, you don't have to do one, but I'm just re represent Samira is a very accomplished poet. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Samira. I do, I do want to just point out that um, the intersection between what you were just describing and building code enforcement has not been something that people have talked a lot about. And so I think that there's a lot of work that the state can do to sort of improve those connections, especially since there's no statewide real organization around building code enforcement and no uniformity. So that's just lofting it up for the folks on the call that are like taking notes about what, what, were, what were the gaps. That's one of the gaps. I also want to give a shout out to Omar Freya, who's one of the leaders of um, um, building cooperatives. Um, and I think co cooperative forms of of, or co companies are gonna be crucial to this transformation. And just giving a shout out to Omar who's on the call. Thank you, Samir, you're the man. We love you and you look great in the White House. Better <laughs> on to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Samir. Um, and hopefully one of these days we'll get to hear some of your spoken word, uh, but it's wonderful to, to hear your passion and all of the great programming that, that NYSERDA is doing now. It's very exciting. And um, especially on the edge of my seat to see how the hubs get implemented. And hopefully that will help to streamline and um, you know, make more holistic and accessible these programs. So we're all staying tuned for that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we will hear from Thomasine Oliphant, who is the director of Ulster County's Office of Employment and Training. Uh, Thomasine is doing incredible work uh, with Ulster County and with the folks who are partnering in the Green Jobs Coalition in Ulster County. And, and then Thomasine is going to pass it off to Joe McDowell. Uh, so we'll hear also from a contractor perspective in all of this. Um, Joe is the owner of JNS Painting and Construction and really committed to, to workforce development on the ground and, and creating green jobs for, for everyone. So I'll introduce you, uh, Thomasine. I think you have some slides. And thank you again so much for being here. I know you, you're on like a whirlwind speaking tour today. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks thank for you. taking the time. Thank you so much, Betta. And thank you, everybody. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here and so glad to be able to represent Ulster County um, for this event. Um, I do want to start and say that in April, um, Ulster County became the first county in New York State and among the first in the nation to, re to release a comprehensive Green New Deal plan. And I would like to preface with that with you just to share, you know, on a local level, what we've been doing to help with job creation and building a, a green collar workforce, what we call. Um, so first, I'm going to just share my screen to share with you a little bit about um, our Green New Deal. You guys see it? Okay. Um, so Ulster County's Green New Deal plan. Um, so there is a link. I'll make sure you guys have the link in the chat. Um, the full plan is posted. We created this website so it's accessible to everyone. This way, all our information about what we're doing regarding our Green New Deal plan and green jobs creation and building a green collar workforce lives in one place and, and how we are working towards really establishing and, and building this green economy here in Ulster County. Um, so we've laid out an ambitious, ambitious agendas across three areas. Um, the first one is accelerating the transition to clean energy um, so that by 2040, we've achieved transformation of our electricity supply buildings and transportation systems. Second one is building the equitable green economy, connecting all of our residents to economic opportunity and creating the educational and business development foundations to place Ulster County at the leading edge of the new industries um, this transformation will spawn. Um, conserving our natural resources and building our resilience to the impacts of our changing climate. 
um, guiding our development with sound cons conservation priorities and ensuring that all our residents enjoy the bounty of our natural resources. Um, so in, in each area, we map um, progress across three timeframes, immediate efforts that will be launched this year, aggressive interim targets for 2025 to guide our work, and long-term transformative goals to reach by 2040. So you guys can take a look at this. Um, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna share this in the chat, but just so you can see that Ulster County, we're really serious about this work and really working together in our community. Um, and I'd like to thank our County Executive, Pat Ryan for, for um, you know, being behind this work and really, really being a beacon of wanting to transform our county uh, into making it an, an equitable green economy and how, um, you know, we're working towards launching green careers internships, um, you know, creating green jobs and working with our training providers to create opportunities. So I want to take you over to our green career opportunities page. And when we don't have time now, but when you get a chance, please watch this amazing video. Um, we highlight one of our, um, our members, Desiree Lyle, who went through um, our Ulster County Career Center, our services to connect um, individuals to green job opportunities, also in partnership with Citizens for Local Power. Um, we created a pathway coming from Citizens for Local Power program into our um, on-the-job training program. Um, and she also was able to get training through Ulster, SUNY Ulster's um, Green Careers Academy. Um, so, I just wanna share that um, over the next 10 years, we'll be creating hundreds of new jobs in clean energy efficiency and green design and manufacturing. We need to install over 30,000 heat pumps, thousands of electric vehicle chargers and over 1 million solar panels to get to our goals. Um, we need to thoroughly retrofit and update our homes to make them more comfortable and energy efficient. We have over um, 750,000 homes in Ulster County. Um, these jobs cannot be outsourced overseas and represent real career opportunities here at home, making our communities greener, safer, and healthier. Um, so these jobs look like installing and maintaining advanced clean energy equipment, diagnosing and improving the energy efficiency and indoor air quality of people's homes, understanding how heat and airflow through buildings to make them more comfortable and use less energy, creating landscapes that naturally control storm water and use fewer chemicals. Um, so Thankfully, we have um, SUNY Ulster's um, Green Careers Academy. You can find more information here. Um, and also, I would like to thank Samir. Um, Ulster BOCES was just awarded um, half a million dollars through NYSERDA. Um, they won the NYSERDA Pond 3981 um, Building a Green Collar Workforce. Uh, so we're super, super excited that you know, SUNY, Ulster, SUNY Ulster's Green Careers Academy was also awarded NYSERDA grant. So we have two of our largest training providers being supported by NYSERDA and we're so ready to take on take on the challenge of uh, building our green workforce. Um, I'd also like the opportunity to share the different internship opportunities we have. Um, the Ulster County Career Center, we have our young adult employment program um, and where we are able to provide green careers internships for young people between the ages of 18 through 24. We've partnered with Joe McDowell, who's here just gonna speak with us afterwards on putting young people in paid work experiences, as well as paid you know, on the job training programs, which that program um, is able to help the employer by reimbursing the wages that they paid out with providing training um, for their employee and provides that permanent job opportunity. Um, we co-enroll with Ulster Youth Build. So we have all of our all of our partners here in Ulster County. We're all working together towards this goal. Um, so Ulster Youth Build, you know, helping the same young population, 16 through 24, out of school, um, supporting them into getting hands-on work construction opportunities. Um, and, and so we've been partnering together with them. And I know Joe will share more about um, the work with Empower Kingston Green Jobs internship, which is through the Citizens for Local Power, um, which is a, which was a paid four week internship program where, inter, where interns gained hands on work experience through a variety of green trades. And we've also transformed uh, made a component for our summer youth employment program, creating a green track for young people age 14 through 20 to make sure that our young people in high school can get some hands on 
training and in, get a taste of what it's like to work in the green field. So we've really transformed all of our um, work experiences. Every every training program that we've have here in Ulster County, we've made up a, a part for um, us to help to build the green workforce. Just prior to um, our, this teaching, we just presented for Ulster BOCES students um, um, about you know building a green workforce. So it's just a great opportunity for us to really get this information out, this, these different opportunities. That video is also going to be shared with all high schools in, in our district as well. Um, so we really want to make sure that young people are getting a sense of what it is, what these job opportunities look like, um, that it's not, it's not just about going to college, that there are great career opportunities um, you know, in these different positions, in these different pathways. Um, and I'd also like to show you, we do have um, pathway charts here for high performance building, clean energy and the water sector. So, um, you know, I'm gonna share this. I know we don't have much time for me to go through it all, but I just want to, you know, HVAC, solar, wind energy. We have these other clean energy career maps that you could take a look at. Um, and also we partnered with businesses to develop the Green Careers Coalition. So, um, and the mission of the Green Careers Coalition is to develop relationships and scalable models to accelerate the county's Green New Deal by helping residents access training and job opportunities and businesses connect with high quality job candidates. So everything that we've done has been informed by our, you know, our business partners. So, you know, Joe McDowell is one of them. So all the work that we're doing when it comes to the training, um, you know, we're making sure that we're really being, you know, mindful of how we are forming our training programs that they that they have the correct, um, you know, skills that the the students or the um, participants are going to be learning, uh, the apprentices they're going to be learning. So we really, really made it um, a partnership approach, and so um, and and now we're even looking to expand this as a Hudson Valley coalition. So we've got interest from other counties, such as Orange County, uh, Dutchess County, and um, just in my work as also a workforce development board director, work together with Hudson Valley uh, workforce development board um, leaders to implement this, the goal for building a green color workforce in our regional plan. So, you know, it's not just only in Ulster County, we're building this out through the Hudson Valley and really making this um, a partnership effort. So I just wanna thank you for the opportunity. I'll make sure that you know our website is in the chat. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'll also put my email in the chat, um, but Betta, thank you so much for this opportunity. And you know all of you, thank you so much for your support and the work that we're doing. It's so meaningful. And you know we are making a cleaner and safer world for everyone. And I'd like to introduce now Joe McDowell, um, amazing, amazing contractor. He's not just a contractor, he's also a mentor to all our young people and our adults that we placed with him. Um, incredible, incredible um, mentor, um, not just with the work skills, but also the life skills, which, is, which are really important. So I'll turn it over to Joe. Hi, good afternoon, uh, morning, afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Joe McDowell from uh, JNS Painting and Construction. Um, I'd like to thank Better and, and you all for the opportunity on your panel, and it's a pleasure to do so. So one of the things that my company does, we do, a, I start off just a, a quick review of my company. I start off painting, and then uh, after a while, you know, you have to learn more about a building that you work on. So then I learned carpentry, uh, I learned how to insulate using right insulation, uh, using um, electric, how to do electric to the homes and roofing and everything. So when you're building a home, one thing is is the, the correct preparation, which is for solar panels, we need carpenters, all right? So the roofs need to be nice and tight. Uh, insulation to keep the weatherization right in the homes. So we insulate uh, windows, you know, make sure there's insulation in the windows. Um, you know, the electric, the plumbing. So everything causes this of, of, of prepping, a, prepping a home so that the weatherization is right and so that bills are low for, um, for the homeowners and or the, whoever's renting the homes. Uh, one of the things we thrive on is doing things the, the right way. And by doing things the right way is teaching. Um, 
if each one teach one something positive, it only gets better and better. And that's our strong beliefs of this strong of this company. Um, so, so one of the things we I discuss with kids, we, we speak about fossil fuels and and what it means. Uh, we 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 join other contractors pertaining to HVAC and solar. Um, so with, with green energy, it's keeping the earth better. And we teach this also. Um, we also uh, linked up with um, Citizens for Local Power, which Thomas C. hit on a little bit. And with Citizens for Local Power, we have interns that come in and we teach them from start to finish how to build a home. So everybody that works for my company, we all know the trade. I have plumbers, I have electricians, we have carpenters, masons, and um, and also they're trained. Everybody's trained with to to do um, with paint painting also. And with painting, you're also learning the rules and regular of, of, of mold. You you learn how uh, lead is involved, how to remove lead. So we put everybody through training, so you know what to do uh, when we come up on these these issues. So everybody's safe that's living in their homes. Uh, another thing that we thrive on is um, mentoring kids. And to me, and this hits real home because this is home. We are with kids at one time, but in the future, the kids are our future. And not only do we teach the trade and teach what it means to, for, for green energy homes and, and to teach um, how to be right in your community and do right in your community by helping each other in the community. And this is something that, that has to be taught and, and is taught by Sean by demonstrating. So we like, we always demonstrate how to do things the right way. You know, from carpentry again, you know, you learn how we, we teach how to do roofs, you know, insulating. They also know the codes of insulation. You know, they know, uh, I have the plumbers who teach, you know, the codes for plumbing. You know, we also teach um, what it means about fossil fuels and, and, and heat pumps and how we install heat pumps in homes. So there's a variety of homes that we did in Kingston, probably like 15 to 20 homes that uh, that re we rehab. And when we go in, sometimes we strip them to bare, bare wood. And Samir hit on it uh, pretty hard about how to prep a house. And that's one of the things we do to prep the houses the right way so they're not losing, um, you know, air or, or that cold air is escaping, the house, warm air is escaping the house. And, uh, and we, we teach why what you should do so this doesn't happen to any home so that's very important and it's good to learn all these all these things that's being taught um to the youth uh another thing is giving back to the community so like i said earlier really, each one teach one and when you're blessed it's good to bless somebody else and by doing that it's not also just giving it's also teaching and learning and we also give back to the community um during the pandemic i had kids who, uh, who couldn't go to school and, and they had the virtual, uh, had to do school virtually. And um, so we decided to, to hire a variety of kids to learn a trade, to help, uh, to teach them how to do homes and everything else, uh, what we discussed earlier. And we also uh, had them give back to community. You know, we cooked and gave back to the elderly. We cooked and gave back to the homeless. We cooked and gave back to the police and the hospitals. But this is part of, of learning social skills and learn how to give back to your community. At the same time, they're learning to trade. Everybody's not gonna get a degree, but when you have a trade, you have something, you have work, you have a future, you know? I was one of those kids that was in BOCES who I spoke to a, a variety of kids, like uh, Thomas C. Hennon about a week and a half ago. And I let them know that, you know, this is, um, BOCES isn't a bad thing. BOCES is a great institution to go to. A great, person, a, a great place to learn your skills, um, a great place to, to, to one day on your own business. But there are steps that you have to make in order to be successful. And, and by doing that, I always teach the kids and I tell everyone, the only person that can stop you from being successful is yourself. Nobody can stop you but yourself. And, and don't get in your own way because you can make it. And, I, and, and encouragement is a thing. Uh, we have to continue to encourage the youth that you are the future. No matter what age you are, you still can make it. You know, and like I said, I always tell them, I'm no different than you, you're no different than me. I was in those shoes before. We always, all of us was in one of those shoes before and we could fit it pretty well. 
But if you want to do it, you can do it. And it's good to encourage kids to do as such and good to encourage everybody. You know, if, if people see you doing the right things in life and, and seeing you walking the right way, seeing you talking the right way, what other way can it be but the right way? But we have to consistently preach what we're preaching, green energy, um, making sure that homes are insulated the right way, making sure that you know, no warm air is escaping the homes, just doing things the right way. If you're taught the right way, it only could be the right way. And nice sir, thank you. Thank you um, for everything that you're doing and giving back for both C's and, and everything else, and whoever else that you are uh, giving to in the programs that's, that we're accomplishing in Ulster County and abroad. And it's, it's highly appreciated. But um, I always say, oh. it's gonna be real quick, I'm almost finished, that if, if it's possible, if, um, I just lost my train of thought, but if it's possible, if we can just teach a little more in all aspects of life and what we're doing, that'd be even better, you know, because people just really the reality of what's going on and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's what's up. I appreciate you. I appreciate your effort and your work and your hard work. I think that the, the, the moment is prime for you, yourself, and the people that you've been training and working with to not only get great jobs, but actually start their own companies and build um, real wealth for the future. Like, I, I love this conversation about jobs. I'm also one of these people, and I'm sure, Joe, you're one of those people. It's like, how can we get people to start their own companies and build their own whole world so they can start building up um, their wealth and their family's wealth? Um, I, I hope that that resonates with you, Joe. I hope that makes sense. Exactly. That's what's up. Um, and if this is the moment, this is the time. We have a lot of stuff in place, and now we have to really push the levers and make that happen. I want to bring in next... Um, uh, Dave and Francis, who are at the Energy, the Association for Energy Affordability. Um, Dave is the executive director, and Francis is the director of weatherization. Um, based in South Bronx, they're doing policy and advocacy, job training, and implementation. Um, they're making buildings more energy efficient, and they're installing heat pumps. And um, so you, it's up to you guys next. You guys ready? Yep. And you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yeah. You can see it okay? I, okay. Okay, yeah, so. It needs to go into play mode if possible. Because um, we can, like, go, if you go to the slideshow, I think, at the top. Then. I thought it was inside. So there be... you go. Okay, click, yeah, click that. And then from beginning, let's see if that works. Is it there? You yeah. see it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I want to. Can I see it? Okay. Yeah, you, you can see it okay? Uh -huh. All right. Okay. So, I want to thank you, Veda, and for everybody on the team, okay, in this uh, teaching today. I think it's been awesome, okay, from my perspective, just to hear all of you, okay? And it's, it's particularly fascinating and, and a source of real joy, frankly, to see both HCR and NYSERDA cooperating so well right now. The challenge is great that we're facing. So we're, we're focusing right now in this session, okay, on weatherization and green jobs in the clean energy economy. And I wanna make a couple of comments to start with about, you know, the reality, the context that we're, that we're in is that we are really facing the, in all of the, clean energy economy, we're facing the need to employ more workers. And at a time that everybody has been in all kinds of settings, both from, from NYSERDA and everything we're doing in, in terms of the HVAC side and looking at contractors who are needing to get really trained and ready to be playing a role in heat pump installation, that everybody is complaining that finding people who are qualified to work on those jobs is a big, a big challenge. So the, uh, and overall, it's also true that in weatherization, we had under ERA, uh, that was also referenced earlier in the discussion, we had a big expansion of weatherization money and the need to actually take steps to address that need to increase our capacity to serve. But just a reminder that 
Actually, New York State had a goal of over 100,000, okay? Actually, units to be completed during era and all the contracts during that time. And actually, we surpassed that goal. So um, the, uh, the notion of ramping up is something that weatherization has already done in the past and is prepared to do, I think, in, you know, in the future as well. We also have a, a context that's really important besides what's happening in New York, and that is in DC, we've got, we've got the ARPA legislation that gives the New York State is still working out the details, but some of the money will be going both to uh, empower to NYSERDA and to weatherization. And that will increase the, the need to respond to that increase money to do more energy efficiency work in low income housing. Okay, the challenge of course, you know, continues to be that the experience from, from the era period, a lot of the small contractors particularly were concerned about they could hire up, but it was a short period of time that money was available for a couple of years. And so people remember that. And so that's one of the other challenges that we face. But I want to also mention in the introduction that, that not only do we have error in the past, we have right now the reality that weatherization reauthorization bill that was passed has some of the pre-weatherization measure, the, the issue that like roof replacement, there have been barriers to doing weatherization that there's money really possible to be dedicated for that purpose. And the same thing in terms of pre-electrification, really preparing housing for, for electrification. And traditional things like the S savings to investment ratio, the SIR, there have been some other guidelines or rules at DOE that really hampered us from being able to do fully in weatherization what we could do. So it's really, it's fascinating to hear everybody is on the same page that we got to take those things on. Okay, use weatherization, which is often used now just for the full weatherization program, but just targeting the issue of, of the envelope. Okay, and weatherization as a measure, doing air sealing and insulation, you know, is critically important to right size anything we do in sort of in the, uh, trying to install heat pumps of whatever, whatever version. And Francis, we'll be talking shortly, is has been very much involved with our efforts to to directly do be engaged in some pilots where we're carrying out that work. So the uh, this slide a little background on AEA, but one of the key things here is that AEA has both been a weatherization provider and a training and technical assistance workforce development provider at the same time. And we're an employer, okay? So we get a chance to train and also hire people that we have trained. And so that there are some unique aspects to that that we'll get into more. So the workforce challenges, we've, we've all been referencing this and hearing this context every day, okay? And it's clearly it comes down to We've got to increase the workforce, but it's got to be a skilled workforce, okay? And the bottom line is the recruiting and developing and retaining skilled workers is a challenge. And it's a challenge for weatherization agencies as well as the small subcontractors who are doing much of the weatherization work. And, and how do we do that? And it's very clear that there's been a lot of reference to the training side and during the pandemic, we've, we've traditionally, we've had an online component, but also very much a hands-on component in our training center. Okay, and combining those things is really, really critical. But we also have to take advantage of the existing capacity in our public education and labor systems in New York. We take advantage of it in a variety of ways by getting referrals from, the, from those systems. But I think overall, in order to have any, any chance to really take this on and achieve our goals, we're going to have to increase that collaboration and leveraging. So one of the things I want to focus on for a minute, okay, is what we did under ERA, because I think it's learning some 
from experiences is important from my perspective. And so we developed because of ERA, but other commitments to low income workers as well. This energy efficiency technician one training. And it's relevant today. Okay, at that time it was developed independent of any BPI certification. Subsequently, BPI has developed something called uh, building science principles that really gets on a lot of these issues. But we also focus very much on what are the jobs and career path that are possible and try to make sure that we focused on all the different range of, of jobs that were possible in the, in the workforce around weatherization. And we did that basically out of a Pathways Out of Poverty grant that we got from Department of Labor. And, and fortunately, we, we were in partnership with CWE, which is a, a union-based organization that's really strong, and, and as well as an awful lot of local wraparound service providers that were, were very important in that process. And one of the things that you know, we've on the recruitment side that we've learned very much is, you know, doing the kind of assessment and job rating and skills support is really critical. And I know that we as a training organization are very dependent upon having that carried out by somebody else as a partner to us. We also have been very fortunate in New York to have the on the job training program dollars from NYSERDA. And, and I think that was referenced earlier and the OJT is absolutely critical. And, and we've been in a position to actually both train workers and then hire them and directly, you know, have them in an OJT environment where we're continuing to do true on the job training and then hire them full time. And that's, that's really critical. And because of the way we focus on several different roles, okay, in the training program, then it's also possible when they're in the OJT, we do a lot of continuing cross training and exposing people to different skills and opportunities. And then we really give them an opportunity to, to play roles in different roles. And that's a, a, that's a very important thing, I think, to build on the career development possibilities and career pathways for folks. David, I just want to nudge you that we're, we're getting close to time. It'll be great yeah. to try to move on. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I know we were at the end and I know we had to be fast. So, but, <laughs> I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be like Brian Lair <laughs> and, gently, and gently transition you to Francis. I got you. So basically, the types of positions we focused on were the ones on the screen. And all those things are really important, particularly the, the energy auditors and installers, okay, and the QCI folks. And basically, uh, a lot of, I also want to mention that DOE and NREL and IREC and BPI are very much behind an awful lot of the certification side of this. And there's not a place that we can get into that here, but it's really important that we recognize that we've been part of that whole process and it's a critically important one. So, yeah, I, I, and I can quickly summarize, I mean, my, my point. And I think that Joe McDowell uh, went over some of the things that I really wanted to, to discuss. I mean, weatherization is a place where we could bring almost anybody at any point and then have them do a, do a job in weatherization. Because, uh, I mean, we do ba ba very basic things like lighting uh, replacement, I mean, uh, CFLs to LEDs, shower heads, because, I mean, we want to conserve uh, the water. So, I mean, those are jobs that anybody uh, can basically just come in and then day one, they, they can be already being used uh, on the jobs. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of installation. I mean, and, and, and we have the needs of people that will be doing some of these jobs. I mean, either, either working for our agencies or working for a contractor. But this is something that somebody can be, can be teach to do it in a matter of hours and then and they can be basically yeah, used Im immediately. I mean, some of the jobs require a little bit more skills. So I mean, uh, the, the person that will be doing the installation inside the cavity or inside the wall, I mean, it's someone that really will have to be trained, but those are things that can easily be, be, be learned and then uh, quickly be, be useful also to, to do. I mean, some of the skills like, I mean, doing the drywall uh, completion, I mean, and sealing, they take skills. I mean, this is not some, something that you can then just take anyone and, uh, and immediately put them to use. But uh, I mean, as Joe mentioned, I mean, with training and, and proper mentoring, 
uh, you could get staff, I mean, to, to be doing those jobs. I mean, we are also involved in, in doing hip pumps. Uh, and and the, the, the beauty of, of the hip pumps is that they, it also has a, a lot of different uh, categories of work that needs to be done. I mean, uh, so I mean, working either on the electrical side of the hip pump or, or, or working, I mean, doing the line side connection and connect, uh, mounting units are, are things that you can learn on the job. I mean, you don't have to bring those skills. It's easier if you have some type of certification or have, or have gone through some classes, but these are things that you could uh, come in and then be, I mean, learn the job so you can then really be useful. Uh, we do depend a lot with, with contractors also. So, I mean, a lot of the thing that we do is window replacements and, and boiler replacements. I mean, and proper construction management is one thing that needs to be done. Uh, and that, I mean, you can learn on, on, on the field, but if you have prior experience, then it's, it's, it's even easier because uh, I mean, we have to make sure and verify that the work is being done according to, to the audit and according to the specs. But, but the beauty is that whether the research is a place where you could come in with very little knowledge of anything and then learn and then quickly advance. I mean, I, I am a clear example of that. I mean, I started a few years ago as a warehouse person and taking classes and certifications that the program were offering uh, allowed me to advance and then get to the position that I have right now. Uh, but but it is, it's really a place where you could really start with very little knowledge of anything and then just advance as you take opportunities. That's all we have. That was great. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> but better, before we jump into the, uh, the questions, I want to just take a moment to thank all the panelists. Um, and um, Dave and Francis, thank you so much for be going at the end, but bringing a lot of value and a lot of real critical content to the conversation. Also want to shout out Nora McDowell, who this is like a family reunion. Her brother and I went to high school together in Troy, New York. So respect to you for being on the call. It's great to see family folks. So this is a family affair on this call. Everybody's, so if you see each other, if you see any of us panelists all around on the street, on the subway, or on the train, or on the Long Island Railroad, the Metro North, act like we know each other. Don't act like a stranger. Um, we want to jump to some questions maybe if you want to. Well, before we do that, Ibrahim. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, I also want to thank everyone and also uh, give Mick a chance to just interject our, our oh, yes. uh, usual take action that we try to include on our on online teach-ins and then we'll we'll get into the Q&A. Uh, I know some people may need to leave. Samantha had to go um, after the first half hour, but we will also capture uh, questions in the Q&A and then follow up with people after. So don't worry, you will get your question answered, but we would like to have some time for discussion if people can stay on a bit. Uh, just wanna make sure Mick uh, has a moment to share uh, a take action since that is sort of a trademark of the teach-in. Yes, thanks, Betta. Hi, everyone. I'm Michaela Shavaco with New Yorkers for Clean Power. And as a part of our efforts to scale up everything that we've been talking about today with weatherization and green jobs and affordable housing um, in terms of programs and funding, New Yorkers for Clean Power, along with 200 organizations in New York, released a letter to um, calling on Governor Hochul to scale up equitable electrification by creating housing that's affordable, free of indoor pollution and environmentally sustainable. As we all know, we need fossil fuels out of our homes and our businesses and communities. So this letter calls on Governor Hochul to set a goal of over 2 million all electric homes by 2030, half of them being affordable housing um, and disadvantaged community based. Um, and create green affordable housing funds and end fossil fuel expansion and create tens of thousands of green jobs. I put that in the chat, the letter and petition link, but I also will just quickly share my screen for that. So if you go to beepny.org, um, you can find the letter here. And then the take action, if you're an indiv individual and want to sign the petition, that would be great. And then you can sign your organization onto the letter as well. And we'll add you with all of these incredible groups. Okay. And should I mention the map? I mean, we don't have too much time, but. To you, my dear. Okay. This is our green jobs map. Um, just because we've been talking a lot about green jobs, 
uh, all of our Clean Power Fellows here at NYCP have put a lot of time and effort into collecting the different clean energy companies around the state that are offering positions. Um, so you can check those out and get more information when you click on each point that's in your area. There's a form there if you want to add a point and then reach out to us if you're looking for a job because we definitely want to connect you with more uh, companies and organizations that are in the climate solutions realm. And you can click on future skills exchange if you are interested in employment training opportunities. Awesome. Okay, so be sure to sign that petition if you haven't already. Uh, NYCP and AEA were both uh, instrumental in, in moving that forward. And I think we all uh, want to see scaling up uh, the great programs and projects uh, that we've been talking about today and go big uh, with building decarb. So uh, do it in an equitable way as we are mandated by law to do. So, uh, okay, we have great some people left, which I'm so happy to see that people are sticking around for some discussion and questions. Um, Ibrahim, do you wanna um, pick a question or kick things off? I think, um, that's funny, I, I, was, I was trying to look for them. I, I don't see well, any there, there is actually a question that you might be able to answer. Um, <laughs> well, and first there's an announcement in the questions about an event that's happening today. Actually, there's two events happening today. Um, a weatherization workshop at Basilica Hudson at, uh, oh, that's on, sorry, October 30th on weatherization day. Um, we can share that. And then I know also at four o'clock today, the Hudson Valley Climate Solutions Symposium is happening in Poughkeepsie and, and Samir is gonna be a speaker at that as well. So. Hopefully people can attend that if they're interested. Um, the, do you see the questions now, Ibrahim or Mick? I, I see a question uh, for Joe that I could ask. Okay. It's, that. Um, it's a little direct, so I hope you don't mind, Joe, but it asks if you're state certified MBE, which I am not sure what that means. Maybe you do. Oh, and you're muted. So uh, this uh, MBE, so the question is, what's MBE? Um, well, uh, are you state certified? Yeah, yes, yes, I am. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I, I'll add in, I'll weigh in that it's super critical for um, MBEs to be, um, for your firms to be up to speed because there's an incredible amount of opportunities that if you have all the right stuff in place, there's going to be more opportunities um, in the coming years. So that's crucial. Um, I just answered a question about the NYU SDG program in the chat. I mean, in the answer, I answered it. Um, I typed the answer, so I responded to that. Someone's asking me, how can they know more about that? Um, and I put my email in the chat as well. So if anyone has any other questions about that, they can do that. If I could just add on that, I mean, weatherization has really attempted to recruit uh, more unsuccessfully than I would like to say, MWBEs, okay, and they're small firms and they're ultimately often they have city, but not state certification. Yep. And yep. so I, the more that we could provide support for those firms, the better, okay, in my view. And, and that's really a high priority that the state agencies should take on. Yes, can I can I uh, intervene with that as well? Um, there's a lot of things that that the, the the small businesses do, and a lot of people. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Don't recognize and, and realize what the small company small companies do in the communities, you know. Um, and there's a lot of things that uh, a lot of the small business don't have grants or don't know how to get grants to do these because I know that. I'm not saying that I don't know how to get a grant or to ask how to get a grant, but a lot, a lot of things that I do, I, I'm the type of person, I don't like waiting to do things to wait a month or two or three. Sometimes you just have to do it, you know? And what we do, we, we, we make it happen, you know? Um, okay. If you can't, yeah. No, I was going to say, Dan, and to your point, but also Dan put in, a, he said it's, um, it's important to take account that many MWBE continue to struggle with the state's certification process. 
And he's offering that a, perhaps a fast track process can help that in that regard. Um, I think that that um, might be something to think about. And for firms like yours, um, that might be something that where you can lean in and give some advice to those folks as that comes about. So that we should keep take note of that because um, I think that that's a really important point. Um, yeah, it's difficult to get that also. It's not, it's, it don't seem like it's an easy, it wasn't an easy process. You know, it was, if there's a shorter way of getting it, it'd be a lot easier for, for men and women, you know? Yep, that's great. Um, for Thomasine, it says, are there any virtual internships offered for those not in Ulster County? She's like, I don't know. I'm not- Virtual. <laughs> um, you know what? We haven't talked about virtual, um, but you know, I can, I. You know, I'm at, I am in the consortium for the other counties. You know, I am connected to all the workforce development board areas for the state. So, and this is something that we have talked about. So if you wanna let me know what county you're in, I can make sure to, you know, touch base with that area to make sure that there's some, um, you know, programs happening in that county. That's so nice, Thomasine. And there may be some virtual ones on the green jobs map Mm -hmm. that Mick shared that we can also send in a follow-up. Yes. Um, for sure, but we appreciate that. Yeah. And, um, you know, usually we have tons of questions. I don't know, I guess we covered virtually <laughs> everything that people are thinking, either that or, or people are just so like amazed and excited about all this great information that uh, no questions are immediately coming to mind because I'm not seeing any. So. Uh, that's okay. And it's 1.15, so which is usually the time that we like to wrap it up anyway. Uh, and this was such a great discussion and, and really important. And I know that we'll be continuing this uh, in future events and hopefully stay connected so we can keep building this movement for green jobs and, and to really expand weatherization and, and make sure that all New Yorkers have access to healthy fossil-free, well-insulated homes. Uh, and so please sign that petition and, and stay involved. And uh, yeah, great to have all of you here today. Really appreciate people taking the time to share your expertise and, and insights and especially uh, Joe and Francis, guys who are, you know, often out there um, making sure that we have better buildings in New York to, to be able to take the time and, and join today is great. And thank you all so, so much for being here. And yeah, any, anything else to, to add, guys? Thank you to Betta. Thank you to from Michaela. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We'll take care. Cheers, everybody. Peace and blessings. Thank you all.